leaders as they did. It was against Moses and Aaron. They were grumbling against the, their spiritual leaders. God had a destroyer come and killed 14,700 of them. Be very careful to grumble, period, especially against your authorities, be it your spiritual authorities, be it your parental authorities, or be it your civil authorities. In this case, it was against Moses and Aaron. Just kind of a little grumble, grumble, grumble. Complain, complain. Judgmental. Hey guys, I wish you could get this without me saying it because it's, it's so easy for you to kind of think, you know, Jim is saying this. <laughs> you should realize, I didn't write this. No, no, no. <laughs> this is what God said. This, you're, you're dealing with God. Verse 11. The Old Testament for us today. Again, he says. Remember how he started out? The word again is in the Greek. Remember how he started out? Verse 6. Look at there. But these are all warning examples to us. Verse 6. Verse 1. Now, don't be ignorant about God's people in the past. All God's people are. And he talks about it. Saying they were all warning examples in verse 6. Now he says again. All these things happen to them as warning examples for us. Why don't we appreciate this and say, oh, thank God, I want to examine my life and make sure I'm not committing adultery, adul adultery in any particular area in my life. That I'm not committing any type of, not only physical immorality, but Jesus said even to look upon a woman with lust in your heart is committing immorality. And so... Uh, one of the ways that I can tell you fellows and that I worked on that in my life was when I saw, of course, once I saw my wife, you know, I was lost in love with her for the rest of my life. But uh, I, you can certainly have a fight with that after you're married, believe you me. Mm -hmm. But when I was single, I, I, frankly, that fight was probably greater with me then. And what I would do is I would pray for that person. Mm -hmm. And it was really hard to think anything bad about and, and, and unrighteous about that girl if I would just start praying for her. Amen. That if I didn't know her, if I just said, Lord, I don't know she, but I pray she gets saved. I pray she'll, you know, follow you. Just start praying. Mm -hmm. That helped purify my life, just as a just as a little side note. Amen. Again, all these things happen to them as warning examples. They were written for us. Written for us. Written for yeah. written for you, Hoss and Andrew. Sam. They were written for you, girls, you guys. They were written for us. Isn't that nice? God wrote these things. It'd be a shame if some of us just got weak or were having physical problems and we didn't know why and we didn't realize that we're not to live like animals. We're not to use our money or time for ourselves or to grumble. I mean, and in fact, did you know that doctors say that anxiety is one of the greatest physical killers? And people have anxiety. You know why people have anxiety? It all comes from selfishness. Mm -hmm. The root of all anxiety. Selfishness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're afraid you're not going to get something. Or you're afraid you are going to get something. And why do you have to be afraid of anything? I always say, if the worst thing happened to you and you die, you go to heaven. How can you be worried about anything? What's wrong with that? Paul said it's much better. I prefer that. I'm only here. I have to be here to help you guys have joy in the Lord, he said. Really, I mean, this is the, if our message is true, if this gospel is true, that really should be where our heart is, shouldn't it? And if you really think this life is better than that life, you are really, really mistaken. I mean, that is going to be fantastic. Not going to be some long, dark tunnel, some purgatory place. No, buddy, you go from this light to brilliant light. You'll see Jesus instantly. And I mean, it'll be great. I can hardly wait. Amen. I would rather be there today than here. It'll be great. Jesus is in a body, mind you. He, it's not just some little bubble cloud somewhere. He's in a physical body. We'll be able to handle him, hold him, and, you know, just love him up. And, 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 and you know, he said, come and touch me. Feel my, my hands and my feet. And, you know, 
he's real. Let's eat fish together. He made fish and cooked breakfast, and he's waiting for us. And finally, when he comes back, he's going to have a big meal for all of us called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be exciting. So, but in the meantime, these things happen. They were all written for us. They were all written to warn us today in these last days. Now, see, this is theological dispensationalism if there ever was one. This verse says this was written for us in this age. I don't care what dispensational theological background you guys came from or I came from, and we've got them from everywhere, but the Old Testament was written for this age. He says this is for this age. These things are warnings for this age, for this time. Verse 12, therefore, anyone who is of the opinion, get this, that God will not do this today, or that they're above it, ever happening to them, Two words. Watch out. Watch out so you won't be among those today that God trusts to the ground to die prematurely. This is an interesting word in the Greek. I think this is the meaning, and I think this is the contextual thought that he doesn't literally throw you to the ground as he did. He had in the wilderness 23,000 one time, 14,700 another time. Basically, Put him to death. Watch out that this doesn't happen. We should appreciate it. I'm excited about this. Because it tells me four things. If I avoid, then I'll be healthy. At least nothing because of sin or unholiness. And uh, we'll live the, the life God wants. And we'll have more power spiritually, even physically. Okay. Now verse 13. How can we have victory over every test? Okay, this is it, guys. This is it. You say, well, I like this, but I've been struggling. This thing is just, this sin, this temptation, these thoughts. I'm just having trouble, whether it's pride, anger, lust, pornography. I don't know what your problem may be. Envy, jealousy. But look at verse 13. But no trial that has overwhelmed you is, first of all, unique to you. Amen. It is not unique. Whatever you probably, yeah. and by the way, you have a problem. Because this verse says so. It's all common. That's part of the reason I'm able to identify. You know, I've shared sermons and talks like this before, and I've had people come up to me and be mad. They said, why did you publicly say this about me? <laughs> and I said, I didn't. What do you mean? You said da 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 and I never said, did it. one time I listened to the tape just to see if I said, da, 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 da. I didn't say it. Huh. But the Spirit was taking the Word of God mm. and connecting. And the reason I could identify, the reason God used me maybe as a little vessel for that is because it's common with me. These are common things. Don't think you're unique. You kind of want to shrink and hide. Oh, you have a problem? What is it? You have a problem with alcohol, drinking, drugs? You have a problem with love? Whatever your problem is, it's common. Amen. You are not alone. Mm. Stealing, kleptomaniac, lying, cheating. What's your problem? You got one because you haven't got to heaven yet. Mm. And the Bible says we have not yet attained, Paul said. So you've got ones. I've got weaknesses. Now, we don't have to, and we're not encouraging you to throw out all your, you know, how short you are in different things unless you've sinned against somebody. Then you need to talk to them about it. But you don't need to throw out throughout that. But you do need to, with God, realize. In fact, that's why you're a priest. You can go to God directly for anything and everything. And here he says, okay, so the first point is for victory. Here's the first point. The overwhelming problem you've got is not unique. You've got to realize that. You are not alone. In this room, you're not alone. And I probably have experienced in one way or another most everything that all of you are struggling or have struggled with. And that's some of the reasons that I can identify. <laughs> Even falling over. <laughs> Literally uh, talking about stumbling. Yeah, talking about stumbling. <laughs> okay, you got that? So we don't need to shrink now. We don't need to think, hey, I'm by myself on this. Okay, next point is this. This is all normal human experience. 
However, God never lets any trial be on you more than you can stand. Mm -hmm. But if we stop there, we say, not true. Mm -hmm. Because I've not been able to stand it. I yield to it, I yield to it, and it gets victory continually. But he says, he makes a statement here at the initial. Never lets any trial be on you more than you can stand. Okay, my question is, why have you not been able to stand? When he said that. Here is why. In fact, God always shows you what to do so you can get out from under the full pressure of any trial, making it light enough so you can endure it and still carry on. Okay, that's the point. In fact, God will always show you what to do so you can get out from under the pressure of any trial, making it light enough so you can endure it and still carry on. Yeah. Here's why you don't stand. There is something you need to do to lighten that load to get victory over it, not total removal. Mm -hmm. Because he wants you to lift that weight to get stronger. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want the weight to put you down on the ground, though. He won't take the weight off. He'll take some of the, bar, the bells off. Mm -hmm. How do you get some of the barbells off so you can stand and endure that test? I'll tell you many things. I'll tell you number one, okay? If you don't take physical notes, you better take mental notes. Number one, you get alone with God every day. If you don't do it, forget it. I don't care if you hear a thousand sermons. I don't care what you do. You cannot have victory without God. Amen. You can't. He's not going to let you have victory without him. So that's the first thing. He'll show you a way, and I'm, I'm summarizing what a lot of ways. We could spend the next hour or hours on this subject, and I could go through Scripture, but I'm just summarizing them, okay? The first thing is getting time alone with God every day. Reading His Word, memorizing a verse, meditating on it, looking at it to obey it every day, getting in the Word. Let the Word of Christ richly dwell in you. David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. I've hid it. I've put it in my heart. It's ready, Solomon said, the wisest man, it's ready on my lips. Do you know how many verses I've been quoting here in the last 30, 40 minutes? Those verses are ready on my lips. The one I just quoted, Psalms 119. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. That word comes up if it's ready on your lips. If the word is not ready on your lips, you won't be ready for the word. Mm. The word will not help you if you just read it, but then when you're out and you're looking at something or you're in a situation, if the word can't come in because you've not got it in your heart, it won't help you. It's kind of like having a sword, or let's say it in a more modern day, it's like having a gun in your bedroom, but not carrying it with you when you go out and you're attacked <coughs> by an enemy. Mm. You've got to have it with you. Or let's say you've got your Bible with you like you've got a gun, but you don't have any bullets in it because, you know, you're under attack and you're trying to find it and get some bullets. And, but you can't remember. You've got to have the word, again, Proverbs, ready on your lips. If you don't have a verse so you can just say it that quick, you don't have it good enough to use it as a defense against the onslaughts of the evil one, to change your life, to change your life. Some of you say, I know one sister that said to me not long ago, oh, I can't memorize. <laughs> but she memorized her name. She memorized her address. She memorized how to get here every Sunday. She, she's memorized so much. We can all memorize. <clears throat> if it's harder for you to memorize, welcome to the club. <laughs> I think I have an IQ of about 10. <laughs> I have to work so hard to memorize. Wow. I thought it was 15 all this time. <laughs> I have to work so hard. Thanks, John. I have to work. John, I have to work so hard to memorize. And I forget, and then I review, and I forget. It's just a constant work for me. Mm -hmm. Yes, John. Yeah, perhaps we should uh, look at Jesus' example in this one, right? Amen. Shoot. Oh, mm -hmm. Lord put up on the... No, and I, you quoted. I don't 
No, I get lost in the sauce. Well, I'll get to it. Let me pull it up a second. I'll read it. Good. So, so Jesus was tempted, and he responded and dealt with the temptation Excellent. in a particular way. So uh, just give me a second. Um, you take your time. So this is so good what John's about to share. This is so good. And while John's looking it up, I'll just add, if this was necessary for Jesus to get victory, why do you think you're going to have to or I'm going to be able to get victory with any less mm -hmm. than while Jesus got victory? Amen. I mean, just think of it. We're, you know, that's silly. If Jesus had to do what John's about ready to show us, how do we think we're going to have victory more than Jesus? All right, this is when Jesus was uh, led out by the Spirit for 40 days to be tempted. And we're fairly familiar with the story, the three temptations. Incidentally, the same three temptations that Satan tempted uh, Eve with. Mm -hmm. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and boastful pride of life. But he said, follow me. So if we're to follow him, do as he does, uh, it's, it's very interesting. So then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he, that is Jesus, answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He quoted the Old Testament in response. It is written. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the uh, uh, and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, "If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written." Now, now Satan's using uh, this. Mm -hmm. He will command his angels concerning you, and on mm -hmm. their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Uh, Psalm ninety-five, twelve. But Jesus responded to him. On the other hand. It is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, the second time, Jesus, it is written, and he quotes scripture that was already written to respond to Satan. Jesus did. Okay? And the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. And, the, and Jesus said to him, go, Satan. What do you think he said next? It is written. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him. And behold, the angels came and began to minister to him. So Jesus himself, who was the author of what was written, didn't even say, well, I'm going to say you were just responding to me. He was very careful. It is written and then quoted each one of those things that he said. You can go in the Old Testament and find them. And, uh, and, uh, and so he gives us the example of how to deal with it. And so, you know, Jim here is talking about having these verses on your lips. Or as David said, he quoted uh, 119.11, where David said, I have hid thy word in my heart that I may not sin against thee. So he not only memorized scripture, but he did them. In fact, you memorize them by doing them, yeah. I would say. Yeah. You know, practice makes perfect as a spiritual law. Yeah. And... Um, and so, uh, and so, and Jesus gives us the example here. So we have everything given to us in the Scripture, and every response, every every temptation that Satan tempts us with falls in those three categories. Generally, the same ones that he tempted Eve with. It's our weakness works every time, and he and he and he used the same three against uh, um, uh, Jesus himself. And Jesus responded with uh, the very thing we have in our hands. Mm -hmm. That's so good, John. And I, I also, while you were sharing that, I was thinking of in Ephesians chapter 6, where he talks about being able, what? To stand against the wiles of the devil. How do we stand against the wiles of the devil? And having done all to stand, how do we stand? He makes it so clear there as you read down. It relates to a number of things. But one of the points near the end is it says, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The spirit is very powerful, but he says his the spirit's sword is rhema, the word, the applied word. And it's kind of like if you have one verse, you've got a sword that's one inch. If you've got two verses, it's two inches. 
How far away do you want to keep the enemy from you? How about getting 20 verses, 50 mm -hmm. verses? So that sword is like a javelin. You can have victory. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Amen. You know, Jim? Yes. In yes. Uh, verse 13 here, it says that God will provide a way of escape. In John 14, 6, Jesus says that He is the way. Uh, and in my life, I spent my entire life battling temptation. And I always thought it was between resisting the temptation or not resisting the temptation. But that was, I wasn't even in the, on the right battlefield. It was really, temptation is really about, will I depend on myself or will I use Jesus as my only way of escape? And when I started praying the prayer, when I stopped saying, Jesus, help me, with when temptation came, and I started saying, Jesus, you are my only way of escape, and I'm okay with that. Then I started getting victory because I was shifting my focus from me and my ability or my inability to Jesus and his ability. And that made all the difference. That's great. And the, and the way I did that was to start praising God. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's our first inclination to say, oh, help me, you know, this temptation is so strong. But I'm focused on the temptation when I say that. Yeah. That's the, the key is to shift my, my uh, attention to Jesus and That's start so praising good. his name. And it's yeah. so much power in that. That's interesting that you say that. Because there's a, in James, there's a, a verse that's only partially quoted all the time, which is, which is a mistake. We've all heard it. Resist the devil, mm -hmm. and he will flee from you. But that's, that's only part of the verse. That's the whole right. verse says, submit yourselves to the Lord. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you, which is exactly yeah. what you did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I think the, the similar principles in First John chapter two, where it says, if it says, brothers and sisters, if you sin, we usually think of something we can do, mm -hmm. like we might even think of confessing, and mm -hmm. kind of like you're saying, focusing on the sin really. Mm -hmm. But in First John two, he says, and I kind of think First John one and. Well, the whole chapter of 1 John 1 is more in the context of contrasting a believer with a non-believer. And one of the characteristics of a believer is they'll acknowledge their sin. I don't think it's that verse 9 is designed for, by sin, kind of a, how I get it forgiven, because I'm forgiven because of the cross. I think it's the full acknowledgement. It says, in fact, you're cleansed from all unrighteousness mm -hmm. if you confess it. So I think it's really showing the salvation principle compared with the lost who say they have no sin. And especially then it goes to chapter 2, and it says, uh, but dearly beloved, now he's talking to the believers, if you sin, and he doesn't say for you to do anything, mm -hmm. he says what you have. You have an advocate with Jesus Christ the righteous. Mm -hmm. He just tones the focus. So you, if you sin, so you'll realize you have an advocate, a, 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 Pericles, a lawyer that comes alongside Mm -hmm. and, and the focus is on him. So that's, that is so good. Well, this is part, like I said, we could spend days on the way of escape. And I think what you said, praising the Lord, thinking of him, and praise is very critical for that. In fact, you see the physical example in the Old Testament again, don't you? Mm -hmm. See, the Old Testament gives the physical pictures of the spiritual things in the New Testament. That's why we need the Old Testament along for other reasons as well. But in the Old Testament... And every physical battle, which were really spiritual battles, but they were physical. Mm -hmm. Picture book. Who did they put out in front? Did they put the, the Marines, the artillery, the, the, the Air Force? Who did they put in front, the very frontal attack, the very front? The choir. The choir. <laughs> the pre, they were singing praises. The Levites went out in front and started singing mm -hmm. praises to God. That had to scare the living day daylights or lift the devils. Yeah, so so what you said is really, it just it, it is hard if you start, well, you know, even talking about being filled with the Spirit. In, in Ephesians, in Colossians, it says, let the word of Christ richly dwell in you, let him umpire in your heart. In Ephesians, the sister verse, where it says, don't be drunk with wine, where you get uh, the physical things to try to take care of you. He said, but rather be filled with the Spirit. And he says, being filled with the Spirit is singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart. Mm -hmm. Singing is a, is a similar to aspect of praise. Mm -hmm. And it, it's another way of escape. We, like I said, there's lots of things we could discuss this. 
But if you're not able, the, by the way, the escape doesn't say escape so you don't have it. It's escape where the pressure is not as great. The, that's what the verse is saying here. It's a way of escape, so it's, and that's why I, I wrote it the way I did, uh, where you're not under as great a pressure. It's escape for me. You'll still have the pressure. It'll still be there, but you'll be able to endure it. That's the literal reading of that word. And praise and singing is one of the manifestations of truly being filled with the Spirit. Psalms and hymns is what? That's Scripture. That was the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Having the Word in you richly, as Colossians and sister verse. And giving thanks, it says, is the next thing. Being thankful. The third thing it says, then being subject to others. When you begin, by the way, if you can make yourself subject to other men and women, you will begin to control yourself so the Spirit of God, because that's the third categorization of being filled with the Spirit there, you'll then have power to be walking subject to him so that Satan or the flesh or the world won't have as much power over you. Mm -hmm. If you do not experience being subject to other people as the Bible commands us to be, subject to other people. See, we're taught in our American culture, be your own self. Don't be subject to anybody. Be proud. Be yourself. Take care of your own. The wise, the Bible says in Proverbs, a wise man, listen to this one, we think the general's the wisest. Proverbs says the wise man doesn't give commands. The wise man receives commands. The wise man receives commands. How do you like it if somebody commands you to do this? You know, with money people, I have to kind of be very gingerly. John, do you mind doing this? What if I said, John, I'm ordering you to do this. Wow, who, who do you think you are? <laughs> 